All right, thanks again for everybody for, for joining in today. Uh, this is a little bit of an experiment for those of you that have joined these uh, calls before where we've traditionally focused in on a research project or, or a general interest talk. Uh, since we all have lots of free time on our hands now and maybe itching to learn some new things, I wanted to start bringing in content that was more of a tutorial nature. And we just so happen to have one of the world's foremost experts uh, to help me with this. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Fatima Benatwala from ESNet. And she has graciously agreed to give us her time today and her expertise in trying to teach a bunch of network engineers how to use Zeek. Uh, so this is a talk that has uh, uh, been given at a couple of conferences before, so it has a little bit of uh, practical experience. And uh, I hope that uh, we could uh, use this as a starting point for building a little bit more of a library of these sorts of talks in the future. Uh, so since uh, all of you are going to be muted, please use the chat feature whenever you see or have a question that uh, you would like to relay. And I'll make sure I jump in and, and stop uh, Fatima as she's talking. And uh, that way we can hopefully make it uh, useful and interactive and share this video with your, your staffs uh, as well uh, in case anybody wants to, to learn how to set up uh, some basic Zeek infrastructure for your campus or your network. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Fatima and uh, take it away. Um, thank you, Jason. Can you hear me? I'm yep, making sure. Okay, making sure not muted. Happened with me in past couple of webinars, so it's always good to confirm. But um, thanks. Um, thank you, Jason, for the introduction. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to uh, everyone, whoever is in like East Coast, West Coast, whichever part of the uh, of the world states. So uh, I'm just going to dri dri directly jump into the talk. And today I'll, I'm going to discuss uh, uh, some basics of uh, Zeek NSM and I hope it's useful uh, for people on the talk. So before doing, before jumping down into the talk, uh, I want to introduce myself and give a little bit of background of, about who I am, what I do, and what is my basic uh, daily activities look like. So uh, I became a very big fan of Zeek IDEA. Since this talk is all about Zeek, then I, that I, I, I just wanted to mention that uh, how I got started and I got my feet wet in Zeek land. So I became a very big fan of Zeek IDEAs. Uh, it was then called Bro. Uh, they recent, well, actually not so recently, but they kind of like a couple of years ago, they changed the name from Bro to Zeek. So there has been BroCons and I have been attending BroCons from like 2016. So when I joined first um, as a security engineer in the University of Delaware, uh, I went to the C conferences because Bro was one of the idea systems you were using there. And I wanted to learn more about how I can use it more efficiently in the network and whether we are doing it correctly, we're deploying it correctly in our, in our production environment in the network. So I, uh, when I started working um, with it like five years ago, um, I became a pretty big fan of Zeek and how, it's, how it works and all the cool functionality it has. As I mentioned before that I started as a security engineer in University of Delaware uh, five years ago. And I recently joined ESNet's security team in Feb this year. So it's just a couple of months now. Uh, my current rep responsibilities include monitoring the network traffic. I work a lot with the different IDS and IPS tools. IDS stands for intrusion detection system and I IPS stands for intrusion prevention systems, mainly like firewalls are the example of IPS. Um, and I do a lot of um, uh, network analysis, network traffic monitoring, incident responding, and like my day-to-day -day activities like uh, triaging incidents whenever they arrive, uh, whenever they happen on the network, and I deal with the SIEM solution as well. So my primary job functionality is on the defense side of, side of the security with some of the vulnerability, vulnerability scanning as well for like offensive pen testing stuff to find different bugs and whatnot in our network environment. Apart from my uh, full-time job as a security engineer, I'm also a part-time PhD student with University of Delaware. I started my PhD back in like 2016. So it's been like four years now. So, uh, and I'm very much interested and passionate about cybersecurity. My, my area of interest in my PhD part is DNS and DNS protocol, its variants and how it's, it's exploited and how it's currently used in the, the network architecture. So enough about me, today's agenda. 
So <clears throat> the roadmap the roadmap for today's uh, webinar is to discuss what is Zeek NSM. Uh, NSM stands for ne Network Security Monitoring. I'm just making sure that I um, expand the acronyms I'm using because a lot of times I kind of like hear at the end of my talk that, okay, you know, you should have explained what the acronyms meant because sometimes some acron acronyms mean different in different situations and environments. So just making sure that I'm having that straightened out. So um, we'll be talking about what Zeek is, why you should use Zeek, like the motivation behind using Zeek, um, some of the network architectures uh, that I have work uh, in production deployment of Zeek, the, the, the forte of Zeek, which is log analysis, like log generation and analysis. So I will be discussing in details, few of the important log files that I have found very useful in my incident responding and triaging as a security engineer. So we will be deep diving a little bit in the Zeek logs. And then I will um, close up the talk with the um, real world use cases and success stories that we had. Uh, experience in the past five years of my um, using and analyzing Zeek log files. Okay, so the big question, what is Zeek? So Zeek is a network security monitoring tool that sniffs the traffic traversing on the network and then generates user-friendly ASCII log files. Um, so in, in the left, it's in the left-hand side, you can see that there are like a lot of um, unconstrained endpoints and uh, laptops and desktops uh, attached. It's basically a passive, sniff, a passive sniffer. So a lot of times people get confused at whether Zeek is in line or out of band. So it works out of band. That means you can have it in the tap mode or you can just feed the traffic that Zeek can sniff out of your network or whatever links you want to um, tap traffic on. And then Zeek analyzes the traffic, gives a holistic view of what's transpiring on your network. And then it produces a lot of different cool log files um, that are protocol specific. So I'll get into that, I will get into the details of what log file looks like, but that's a pretty awesome um, feature that I love about Z, the log files it generates. Okay, so why to use Zeek? <clears throat> As I mentioned before that it is a powerful um, engine that classifies the network activity into different types of log files. And I'm focusing more on the log files because I have never seen anything anything other than Zeek that produces the log files that are based on the traffic patterns it is seeing. Like for each different protocol, it will have a different separate protocol uh, log file. So you don't have to like juggle through the uh, thousands of uh, bytes of PCAP to find out HTTP traffic or to find out DNS traffic. So Zeek does it just uh, out of the box. It will have a DNS.log or it will have an HTTP.log file for that particular application that it has seen on your network. So it has a very strong um, blogging framework. And I just, that's the one of the, one of the features that I love about Zeek. And Zeek is different from any other typical IDS system. I, Zeek, I would not mention, I would not call Zeek as an IDS uh, because IDS is intrusion detection system. It is something that is built to alert you automatically if, it's, if something is happening on your network. Zeek doesn't do that. Zeek produces the log files and it, it just shows you what's going on on your network. You can absolutely create the alerts based on the log files it is generating, but that's not the primary purpose of Zeek. So that is a different um, the definition of what the other idea systems do and what how Zeek is different than those idea systems. Uh, it has great community support. Uh, Zeek developers, they have their own Slack channel. The documentation is awesome. They have their own mailing list. So if you are a newbie and you are starting off using the if you're starting off um, with Zeek, you can absolutely post the question. This is how I learned Zeek. So when I started I, I didn't have any idea what you know should I should ask or whatnot. I just started posting the questions online uh, to the Bro mailing list, Zeek mailing list, and I started getting the answers. So th this is how I learned and grew. It is five years ago. So in five years, Zeek has improved a lot on the open source or the internet fingerprinting. Like they now are more um, prominent on the internet and like the community is very active and vigilant. So that is uh, another plus point with Zeek. It has strong scripting and logging framework. You can customize the log files. Uh, you can detect whatever patterns you want to detect in the traffic, and you can generate your own log files based on whatever you want to detect in the traffic. Uh, I have use case for that. So if you are not getting what I'm like, what I'm trying to explain, we can get to that in, in later slides. And also it's not like Snort. So one of the other questions I always get is um, like, and it's a very genuine question that uh, what, 
how Zeek is different than Snort, are they same? If I'm running one, do I have to run another? Or if I'm running Snort, do I don't have to run Zeek? I have to tell that they are apple and oranges. Like you cannot compare apple and oranges because Snort is a signature based intrusion detection system. It has uh, alerts and it has signatures that triggers those alerts. It doesn't give you an holistic view of your network. Whereas in Zeek, it doesn't trigger the alerts unless you tell it to trigger it. It gives you a holistic view of what is transpiring on your network at a given point in time. So that's a very brief uh, discussion on the difference between Snort and Zeek. Okay, so the first network architecture. So in my previous job at UD, this is what our network architecture looked like. It is highly simplified. So no, no, no network in the world looks that simplified. So you, you, you guys would be like, no, it's, it doesn't look like production. But believe me, it's production network. Uh, it's highly simplified format. So I can explain quickly. So we had two border routers. And uh, we were sniffing two 10 gig links that, uh, that, that connected the border routers to our core routers because those were the two pipes that were going out of the internet. And uh, it was not south traffic. Uh, traffic sniffing because north south what i mean from north south is when you you have your own ip address space and your ip and, and 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 when your systems talk to the internet right so you will have either the source ip or destination ip belonging to your network and the other ip belonging to the, belonging to the internet so that's what we call north south traffic analysis so this network architecture is primarily based on the north south traffic analysis where we were ta uh, not tapping where we where we were port mirroring uh, the ports on core router one and router two. So the red lines in the graph, uh, the red lines uh, in, the, in the plot, these are the port mirrored um, traffic lines from core router one and core router two. So Gigamon, Gigamon is nothing but a load balancing device that makes sure that it, it sends the stream of flow of one connection to one row box and just do a symmetric hashing uh, because Bro has to see the complete connection, like Cincinnati Ag, and the, and the stream uh, complete stream flow of the connection. And then uh, Gigamon was load balancing it to uh, our other idea systems and primarily were Zeek nodes. So we had four production Zeek boxes. They were the workers. Uh, they were the ones that were receiving the stream from Gigamon. They processed the packets and then they passed the logs central to a central location called Zeek managers. That's another fifth box that Zeek nodes would talk to. It would be like somewhere here. And that centralized uh, manager will collect all the logs that these, these, these Zeek workers would generate. So this was a very highly simplified uh, network architecture that we deployed in, um, at UD. And this is the second network architecture that we currently have at ESNet. So this is more east-west traffic monitoring. From east-west, I mean that we have a distribution switch that goes in our data center and connects all the um, all of our LAN network uh, equipment to the internet. Uh, we have a firewall and then we have a bypass to the um, to our core router, which in this case is our ESNet Star router one. And then that router connects to our WAN site routers. So uh, in the previous architecture, if I have to compare, these were the two links that got, uh, that we were tapping, like the north-south, because those were connect connecting to the internet. And but here in, uh, in ESNet, we actually tap the data center traffic because that's where we get the symmetric routing. Symmetric in, se in sense that Zeek has to see both the sides of the connection. It cannot be like asymmetric routing. Uh, we, are, we, like, we are experimenting with Zeek on the van where uh, Zeek will get asymmetric traffic, but it's in the process. But for time being, this is our second architecture where uh, we have 10 gig links. We have wire taps in this case. We are not doing port mirroring. So these wire taps forwards all the uh, mirrored, uh, all the tab traffic, duplicated traffic to the, to the Arista box. Arista is similar to Gigamon. It also does the load balancing and makes sure that it does the symmetric hashing of the traffic flows and, it, and each flow should go to individual uh, Zeek workers. So, and we have Zeek nodes here. So in both the architectures, Zeek is like passive detector. It sits on your network, sees the traffic of the links and then generates lots and lots of log files. So I hope it, it makes sense. Uh, let me know if you have any questions regarding any of the architecture that um, I, have, I have discussed. But yeah, this is primarily east-west because uh, the, 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 LAN, uh, the, the, the VLANs that are behind this distribution switch, switch will talk to each other using this router. And then since they will go like from the distribution switch to the router and then from the router to the distribution switch, we, we should be able to see the east-west traffic as well from these two wire, wire taps. So that's another difference between both architectures. 
Okay, so the log files, the, uh, the forte of Zeek is creating the log files and I have mentioned it like five or 10 times in just two or two slides. So coming back to the logs visualization and consumption, how Zeek generates the log. Zeek basically uh, has very easy concept. It sees the traffic and depending on what protocol traffic it is seeing on the network, it creates a corresponding log file. So the, the boxes in the green are the, uh, are the conventional log files like dhcp.log. You can infer that dhcp.log contain the DHCP related traffic in the network. DNS.log would contain all the DNS sessions and transactions happening on your network. FTP would have the F FTP uh, protocol log files uh, events. And similarly, SMTP, SMTP will have SMTP related traffic in the, uh, in the, in the traffic. The red ones, however, is uh, one of the uh, nice features out of the box that Zeek has. So apart from generating the protocol log files, what Zeek does is, is it, it watches your traffic for kind of like activity that would be interesting and uh, like statistical analysis, like how many servers you have, what kind of services you are running on your network, uh, what kind of certificates are there that are installed on your, on your uh, servers and whether they are valid or not what kind of hosts you have. Uh, Notice.log is very uh, cool file. The ones that I have highlighted are the ones that I use the most. So I don't have anything uh, for, for the other log files that I, I haven't highlighted, but you can see that it's like more than 30 log files Zeek has already generated. This is from the production uh, network. So it, nothing here is stub data. Everything is from, is from production. So coming back to the logs, uh, it has more than 50 protocol parsers. That means if your network sees all the 50 kind of protocol, you will have 50 log files in your, in your log uh, directory that Zeek maintains logs in. But we don't have so many protocols running on our data center traffic, so that, that's why we have very few protocol related log files like HTTP.log or SMTP or DNS. But in case you have other protocols, you will be able to see those protocol log files as well. So as I said, apart from conventional log files, it generates the logs that are noticeable and you can uh, actually take um, advantage of it. So software.log, I just love that file. Uh, one of the log files I love is known services.log. You just get, you, you get the appreciation just by looking at the log files that how blind you were to your network and you didn't know what kind of like services you were running or sometimes you know, or in theory, you, you have an idea that, okay, we should have at least 50 web servers or 100 SSH servers. But until you go and verify it in your log files, you would be amazed at how much activity is going on in your network. So it just gives you that um, visibility in your network. So, uh, and we will be discussing some of the unconventional log files like known services, notice, software, and weird, and not weird actually, Intel log, log file, Intel, this one. So I will go into the deep dive. I haven't, I, I, I haven't ha have any um, screenshots for the conventional log files because you, you, they are pretty conventional and I can show you how they look like um, in coming up slides. Pretty log files. Uh, yeah, Hakima, we have uh, and, one question that came in. Uh, where can we follow the status of the asymmetric compatibility work? Uh, there is, there are some talks that my colleagues have given before. I think there was a talk in last year. Um, I, I'm talking about the asymmetric work that ESnet is doing, uh, Zeek on the Van. Uh, I'm not sure whether there is a generic public source project that is going on right now. Uh, I don't think so, it, it is. Uh, but the work that ESnet team is doing, there was one talk last year in Brocon and one talk in the Bro workshop where I have learned about the asymmetric work. So. Yeah, nothing open sourced right now or nothing published yet, but whenever we have some results and progress, I hope my team members would be definitely be willing to publish what and how you can do the asymmetric um, routing tapping or routing analysis or asymmetric routing traffic analysis using Zeek. Okay, thank you. Sure. Oh, that's a good question though. Yeah, it's very interesting, like how all the other, like, Idea systems have to see the whole transaction because then they would they are not smart enough to make or in, to make an inference of you know if they just see one side of the connection. I had stories that happen in our symmetric routing environment, uh, but it's a whole different talk. Uh, I had a whole talk to discuss that that scenario, 
uh, if people are willing, it's, it's called Is Weird Really Weird? I talked about it last year in Secret. But okay, coming back to the software.log. Software.log, as the name suggests, it's so a lot of times our systems are very noisy. Like as soon as you connect your system to the internet, it will just advertise everything it has, like the browsers you are using, browsers will adver advertise the plugins. If there are servers, they will advertise like, hey, I am ready for the update. All these packets that are traversing on your network, Zeek utilizes them and then they, it produces a software.log file saying that I have seen these kind of software advertisements on your network. Uh, this one, the first one, it, it shows the operating system and version. So you can see that uh, Windows operating system has been detected, like Windows 10 is running, Macintosh, uh, Mac operating system is running. There are a lot of iPhones um, that are connected to the network. So the reason I am say, I'm showing this software.log file is very interesting because we use it all the time. So whenever we have to audit our network, like when we, we always get the request that, um, can you list um, like all, all the old Windows 7 servers because now Windows 7 is going out of life. So we have to notify our users that, hey, by the way, you have to update. And if they don't comply with the policy, then we can take actions like disabling their network or you know nuking them off of the network. We haven't done that yet because you don't want to annoy your clients, but that's, that's a use case for um, operating system and versions information. So yeah, and, and another thing is like for security engineer, it is helpful in doing network triaging, actually incident triaging, incident responding. So a lot of times we get alerts from our IDS systems that a system has downloaded a binary. And uh, a lot of times those exploits are targeted towards a, a very specific operating system. For example, we got an alert from Petya ransomware. It was highly targeted towards the Windows operating system. But one of the IDS systems alerted it for a Mac operating system, like a system that was running Mac operating, uh, operating system, uh, that system downloaded that file. We knew that it's a false, po well, it's a true positive that it got downloaded, but it's, it's a false alarm because it is not going to do anything bad on that Mac OS. So we just intimated the client saying, hey, you have to get, get rid of this binary because you know that's ransomware, but it didn't exploit that system because that system was running Mac OS. So that's a useful information to keep it handy when you are doing incident responding as a incident responder. Same with browsers information, a lot of exploits uh, come out, a lot of vulnerabilities come out, CVs come out that exploits a certain version of like Chrome browser or Firefox browser or you know whatnot. So if you have that information and if you are getting alerts on that CVE, you can tell that how vulnerable your network is. Like even if you, you don't get any alerts that anybody has downloaded it, you can get a profile of attack surface that you have like you can get a list of all the systems that are running vulnerable software or like vulnerable browser or vulnerable operating system and you can say that okay this is our risk profile of our network so this is very helpful information for audit trace and to do all the other kind of um, cool network risk management stuff applications this is the continuation of software.log so there are two more things that i wanted to show on software.log that we use highly uh, we highly use in our network is this one applications and versions so app servers so if you have http servers that are running it tells you that uh, which application and what version it is running and i always don't get a good feeling whenever i see php running an old version because there are so many exploits and there are so many vulnerabilities that are out there for PHP. So I just, I just pray that I don't get a file that has a server that is running in a very old version of PHP. And if we do, we just directly go verify whether it's a legit server that is running that PHP version. And once verified, we just intimate the user saying, hey, you are running old version, please upgrade because otherwise we will you shut you off from firewall or something if it's highly vulnerable. So it's good information. Uh, different plugins, same goes with different plugins. So all this information you can use is for two or three different cases. Like if you're doing incident responding, if you're um, analyzing your risk profile in your network, and if you really want to do audit trials, like if you really want to get rid of old software from your network. So you should absolutely go and check out software.log file. Different plugins, uh, I wanted to mention one plugin that I just don't like to show up on different plugin is Flash. Uh, Adobe's Flash is uh, weird. Like old version of Flash have a lot of exploits. And just like I just don't, it doesn't evoke a good feeling when I see PHP old version. It doesn't evoke a good feeling when I see Flash and a very old version of Flash running, like 2600151. 
So yeah, these are the things you should keep an eye on just to know that how much vulnerable you are to attack. The second interesting log file, and these log files are not conventional protocols, so that's why I'm showing these up because these are highly useful. Known services, I cannot explain how useful this, this file was in my previous job. Like we had a very big project where we wanted to um, move our VLANs from the default inbound allowed to a strict. That means we have to block inbound to that VLAN. And the, and the part of the project was to know what services are running on that subnet, right? Because you just cannot take a subnet and move it behind a firewall and say, we are, we are blocking all the inbound. You have to know what services are open to the internet, ask the user that do they still want those services to be open? And if they're even aware of those services being open on the internet, and if you get a green, green flag that's saying, okay, go ahead and make it, make that change, you can come back and make that change. So that was a pretty big project. And all I did was go, no, go to the known services.log file, the subnet that we're trying to protect from internet, search that subnet in the known services.log file and see what all servers come up with all the open ports and what services. So for example, if I have a, if I have a subnet and on that subnet there are like a couple of web servers running, uh, a couple of DNS servers running, a couple of SSH servers running, we will get a list of those servers. We will verify by active scanning. And then once we verify that ports are open, we would intimate the user. And a lot of times, users don't even realize that those ports are open on their system until we go and intimate them that, hey, by the way, do you know this port is open on your system? They're like, we had no idea. And you know, so, so that's, those are kind of like stories that, um, that evolves. So yeah. The first big use case for this log file was um, firewall uh, firewalling off the subnets on our um, on our LAN uh, and protecting them from the inbound internet. And the second one is vice versa. Like, um, and we had a great success on that project. Um, and the second one was vice. So I was so I was start I was targeting a very privileged subnet that was that shouldn't have any services open to the internet. And I was going over the results with my manager and then he looked at an IP address and that IP address was showing SSH port open. So just like you see this SSH here, um, SSH ports open, it says empty. That means the port is open, but the handshake wasn't complete. That's why the service was not being able to detect it, not being detected by bro, which is good because Firewall is blocking some part of the connection at least. So, uh, so yeah, so a, an IP address showed up and my manager was like, oh, this doesn't look right. This IP shouldn't be on the list because this IP belongs to a very privileged subnet and that IP should not be advertising SSH service open to the internet. And I was like, but, but bro is seeing it. And I was like, whether it's a false positive or, or true positive, let's check that out. So I did a PCAP capture, quick PCAP capture for that IP address on our Zeek servers. I did the PCAP capture on that actual system um, because we own that system. So that system is Zeek Zeke saw Cincinnagag. That means the port was really open and it was open to the internet. And there was firewall in between. So Zeke was sitting out, outside the firewall. It was, it was sniffing the north-south traffic and then the firewall and then the system. So we thought that maybe firewall, firewall is not blocking that port, but we, we confirmed that that subnet was behind a very strict firewall policy that should block all inbound, all inbound connections. So I was confused that why, like external, external to the firewall, we were get, getting the complete connection. The system was seeing the complete connection, but the firewall, I couldn't see the connection on the firewall. Like firewall was just seeing the half open traffic. That means it was just seeing outbound. There was no inbound sin. So we marked that project as like mystery of the missing sin. I think I spent it like I spent I spent like a week or something just figure out why this is showing up, and then finally uh, like back and forth calls with the firewall vendor that firewall is not seeing sync packet for some reason. I can confirm that sync is reaching to the to the machine. I can confirm that sync is seen outside the outside the firewall, but some for some reason firewall is not seeing sync. So that's why we named that project the mystery of the missing sin. So it turned out that there was a leak, uh, a bypass route that that sin was taking. And that's why it was not uh, detected by the firewall. And that was a very fun project. And then like we opened up a ticket and we resolved it. So it turns out that there are a lot of firewall misconfigurations 
that you can fix by looking at the Z log files and if you know what they should look like. So that was a very interesting project and fun project that we uh, that we found a bug just by looking at the known surfaces.log file. Okay, so the third file is notice.log. Um, I'll just quickly brush through it because um, it's a lot of uh, things you can all automatically infer from that file. So uh, I'm grepping the scan. So there are a lot of there are a lot of scripts that are prepackaged in Zeek that detects weird activity on your network. Like for example, if somebody is scanning or your on your network, it will get detected and picked up and it will get logged into the notice.log file. It is named notice.log because you should pay notice and attention to that log file to see what's going on on your network. So these um, these address scan and port scan, so there are pre-built scripts that comes with Zeek. So you don't have to worry about writing your own custom script, script to detect that. There are custom scripts available that you can pull and, um, and enable in Zeek that does fine granular scanning detection. Ashish Sharma wrote a really good uh, scan ng package. It's a Zeek package, a scan ng, scan next generation. Stand. ng stands for next generation. So we had that and it would do a fine grained um, logging of scan, like what kind of scan is happening. Is it a backscatter scan? Is it a knock knock scan? Is it a port scan or whatnot? But this here, I'm just showing the basic port scan and address scan. And we take actions, like whenever we see IP addresses in notice.log that is uh, detected for scan, we block them right away on the border. Like we don't even pay a second thought saying that should we or should we not, we just block it. So we have this higher confidence in Zeek reporting the scanners on our network. And that out of the box, you don't have to do it. Just install Zeek uh, on the box, um, sniff the traffic, and whenever you see a scanner, just block it. So the scan detection, I wanted to show uh, where we can take where we take action. Invalid SSL search. So the another thing, another cool thing that Zeek comes with is it does the certificate chain validation. So if you have web servers or if your clients are visiting some websites that have web servers uh, on your network, it can say that uh, it can log that whether it was able to validify validify is it the right word. Valid, whether it is whether it can validate the certificate chain and if it can then it will just log it saying that we have seen an invalid server cert on your network so and you can if you have self-signed cert you can ignore this alert but if you have an environment where you don't allow people to uh, use self-signed cert then you can definitely take action because a lot of time Back in UD, uh, we had a lot of researchers who would just spin up a web server for the research purposes. They would not ask for a valid certificate. They would just have a self-signed certificate and it would, it would get detected right away from notice.log saying, hey, this is an invalid certificate. And we would, whenever we would, we would go over those alerts, we would, have, we, would, we would come across like this big giant list of all the web servers running with self-signed certificates. So you can take action, you can ignore it. It's up to you and depending on your network, architecture and whether you allow it. But that's another cool thing that it detects. That's why I, I showed it. SSH password guessing. Again, this is not something that is customized to our network. It comes with Zeek. So if people are doing password guessing on your network, on SSH port, you will see the alerts like this in notice.log file saying an IP address like appeared to be guessing passwords and it has seen, Zeek has seen 30, 30, 33 or 34 or X number of uh, unique connections that, that IP was trying to connect on port 22. Again, we, uh, we take action, we directly, whenever we see these alerts, we block the IPs. And whenever I, when I'm saying we block it, it's all, it's not automated. Like we are not using an external cool tool that is, that, like, that is a commercial tool that does it. No, these all are flat log files. And that's why I was focusing more on the forte of Zeek is flat log files. If you know enough like command line Kung Fu and if you are good with bash scripting, you can just write a bash script that would tail on the current notice.log whenever it sees a, a match for like string like password guessing or SQL injection or scanner, just grab that IP. And if you have like a black hole router setup, then just forward that IP, uh, announce that B out IP via exit BGP to the router and the route router, would, router will null route that IP address. So everything is available. Uh, the, the BHR code, the black hole routing code is available on GitHub, open source. You can put it down and you can integrate it with Zeek and it will work just fine. So nothing here that is very customized or 
people might think that, okay, this is happening and we are only doing it. Everyone does that. So these are the uh, quick wins that you can get right, right off the bat whenever you install and have Zeek running on your network. Uh, the last one was SQL injection attacker. So it is again, out of the box. We haven't done anything special cool on our network. Whenever Zeek sees an attacker like that, it logs it into, into the notice.log file and we, we block the IP addresses. So the four cases that I have, I have shown are truly based on notice.log and the four cases we take action on. So that's why we have, I have shown four. There are more cases which we don't pay attention to, but these are the four cases we take the IP and take the action of like blocking that IP on the border. So that's why I was showing that, oh, this is the power of log files, unconventional log files that Zeek generates apart from the local protocol log files. Uh, it's log files, intel.log. Uh, log. I will not pay uh, too much of time on the slide. IOCs is indicator of compromises. It is available all over the place. Like if you just search for IOCs on the internet, there are so many websites that give it out for free. Like a fish tank has like bad domains all the time. Like it keeps updating. So you can just pull down the fish tank and you will get the IOCs for the domain. I'm showing you only the IOCs for the IP address. So you can infer it from here. So Intel address. Zeek supports the bad IPs, which is called Intel address. It supports bad URLs. It supports bad domains and bad certificate hashes. So all these kind of uh, Intel Zeek supports. I'm only showing you the IPs because that's where I, we can take action. Uh, so, and there's a confidence level. So whenever you pull IOCs from any of the internet websites, it gives you a confidence level that how confident it is that that IP is malicious. So these IPs, well, it's only one IP, I think. So we pull down the IOCs, we have, in it, you have to, in it. so this is something customized. You have to enable the Intel framework in Zeek and pull down the IOCs and enable it in Zeek so that Zeek can take those IOCs. And whenever it sees the connections, either the source IP or destination IP, or whenever it sees those IOCs in the traffic, it will generate a, an event and it will log that event in intel.log file. So if you have IOCs enabled, IOC, Intel framework enabled, you should be able to see intel.log file. We take actions on all the bad IPs that Zeek detects in our network um, and that are like reported by either spam house or if they are, if we have enough confidence, like if the confidence rating, it is not showing here, but there's a meta field here, which is meta.cif confidence, which shows you the confidence percentage. So if it is like 85 and above, we just go ahead and block that IP addresses on our uh, border. So you can absolutely block the blacklisted IP, IPs or IOCs if you are seeing it on your network using the Zeek's Intel log file. Putting everything together. So, so far I have shown you is all the Zeek flat files on a command line. And if you just need to have a bare minimum basic of how you can use awk, grep, to zcat a, a log file. I haven't shown you the uh, cases where we have used a seam solution and integrating everything. But it is not like you cannot use it. You can absolutely use it. And we used it. So Zeek logs in themselves have a lot of um, useful information, but it would do great if you would correlate, if you can correlate that information with other IDS tools or other network traffic monitoring tools that you have. So it's not a necessary thing, but you can absolutely do it if you have one in place already. It's useful for threat hunting and IR. Um, and yeah, so Zeek logs, you can throw it in into one central big location and then you can start correlating. And instead of writing your own bash scripts for doing automated action, you can let Seam do it for you, like automated action, whatever you want to take based on just Zeek logs or correlating it with the other NSM logs whatever you want to do with it. Zeek logs cheat sheet. So Zeek have more than 50 protocol parsers. And how you know that what column stands for what? So there is a cheat sheet for Zeek that is available on this website. This I have just shown, shown the snippet of what it looks like. So there is a con.log and these are all the fields uh, you will see in the flat PSV file. And this is what they mean, like the history originating by packets, uh, VLAN number, history, missed bytes, local. So you can go over uh, each field and see what they all mean. So for DNS, it has a complete connection, like request and response in one single event. And what that event looks like is all these fields here. So you can absolutely go and check out uh, if, you, if, you, if you have a hard time understanding what the log file looks like and what are the fields, you can go and absolutely check out this very, very well uh, described 
a cheat sheet of what the logs uh, say. Finally, use cases and success stories. I have covered pretty much a uh, majority of it when I was explaining the different log files. And that was the reason I was explaining the different log files because we were just using them right off the bat. We didn't have any like centralization location where we were pulling it and then doing the analysis and statistics. But to reiterate, uh, policy and compliance. So I have shown you the software.log file. It's a flat file, Z generates it, just pull it, and you can do all kinds of audits. Like a lot of time we used to get a lot of requests from the higher management that every now and then in like once a month or something that, well, can you pull out all the open SSL old versions on the system? So you just want to verify what kind of uh, uh, libraries are being used. And if they are too old, can you just notify the users saying that you have to upgrade it? And we're like, okay, so auditing purposes, you can use it completely for auditing purposes, vulnerable software. So if you are an incident responder, you can absolutely check out that file for incident responding purposes as well. Oh, uh, this is a pet was for open SSL. Open SSL being the library that is used for the um, secure connections on the web. This is the list we came up with, uh, with, with the audit of all the, um, all the all the IP addresses and the uh, MAC corresponding MAC, ad, uh, MAC addresses that were using very old version of OpenSSL. So that's why I had just a snippet. You can absolutely do it for OpenSSH as well. Detect firewall misconfigurations. Um, I have already discussed the uh, mystery of the missing scene, mystery of the missing sin use case that we had that was on our production cluster. A uh, valid application getting blocked. So if Zeek is reporting an application, but it is getting blocked by firewall, you can absolutely unblock it and vice versa. If you are, you can, you can maintain an automated alert, right? Like if somebody uh, comes up with a new web server, you should get alerted that the subnet should not have new web servers or because users are mischievous like that, especially researchers uh, back in the UD days that they would just spin up something without knowing that, you know, it might, get vulnerable or attacked by the internet. And we would get alert all of a sudden that, okay, this is a new web server that is showing up on this, on this subnet. And we would verify that, okay, should we block it? Should we allow it? They should let us know if they are putting up a web server. They should comply with all the security um, requirements, minimum requirements to, uh, to have the system hardened enough to put it on the internet. Absolutely, all, all kind of crazy stuff you can do with the um, detection of firewall misconfiguration and whatnot. The third use case is enumerating services and servers. Oh, that is very cool. Um, so I had two stories to tell about how enumerating services and servers can help. So remember I was showing you the known services.log file where we had two use cases where um, we were moving the VLANs behind a firewall and we wanted to know all the services running on that subnet so that we don't accidentally block a legit application from the internet. So, the, the incident responding use case of the similar story is, um, so th there was, so we, we were getting a lot of D DDoS attack from internet on the DNS port on our network. Like we were getting so many, like thousands and thousands of IPs trying to connect to port 53 on our slash 16. And of course they are, there are client systems and the users client machines that do not run, I hope they do not run port 53 service on their system but there are just some few legit DNS servers that we have. So what it was doing was, it was generating all the ICMP back because those systems were replying back saying, hey, we do not have this service open. So it was having a ripple effect. So it was a DDoS attack of DNS and the system, since they do not have port 53 open, they were responding back saying ICMP port unreachable. It was triggering our NetFlow alarms saying there's an excessive ICMP traffic on your network. So it was like a chain reaction. And I was like, why these systems are responding with ICMP packets? And it turned out it was a DNS DDoS attack. So we realized that we need to take action and we should absolutely block all the unwanted services that we do not want from internet. So we came up with a list of um, like 12 or 14 different DNS servers that were running on our system. And we didn't run toil 12. We had only four DNS servers other professors and other sub IT departments were running their own DNS servers. We asked them that, that, can we run it for you? And they're like, no, don't touch it. And I was like, oh, okay, it's better to have only 14 servers open to the internet on 453 rather than slash, rather than complete slash 16, right? So that dramatically reduced our um, attack surface. So it's, it's good to know which services and how many servers are open to the internet. 
same story goes with HTTP web server. Like we all, we constantly got attacked on like DDoS attack on our web port. And since, since they know, since the attackers do not know which server is web port, a web server, they would just constantly hit all the slash 16 IP address, IP address space with on port 80 and 443, and they would all res respond back saying ICMP. And we will get NetFlow alerts saying a lot of ICMP is happening. So, so, so yeah, so integrating web ser services and servers was another use case that spun out of known services.log file. So we were able to, in production, we were able to block inbound to the DNS servers web servers and NTP servers and SSH servers. So we only had a handful of those servers available to the internet, but rest of the rest of the network was completely blocked. Like we were blocking in the, the whole network. And once we did that, it like uh, alleviated the um, alerts of a net flow, like XS YCMP and DOS attacks. So it kind of like elevated our attack service surface. So that's why I just wanted to share that story on that third use case that if you are wondering that what's the use of, you know, enumerating service and service, that's the use. And another thing is a lot of times, again, we get requests saying, hey, by the way, do you know how many web servers roughly we run on our network? And I'm like, let, let, me, give, let me get back to you in five minutes. And I would just go to the known services. I would just pull it out and I would say, oh, okay, it's only 250 servers or 500 servers. So it's kind of like to answer those kind of questions that, you know, that how much, how many services and what kind of servers you are running on your network. Malware detection, I have briefly mentioned about malware detection incident response. Um, quick use case. Again, the, the Pedia ransomware, it got downloaded on a Mac machine. It cannot do any harm on Mac, but we intimated the user saying, hey, remove that, that binary. So a lot of time incident response is the main and main use case of Zeek logs because that's our first stop to do any kind of forensics analysis on what had happened in the past or to do active analysis. Like if some other ideas has triggered an alert, we want to confirm before um, notifying to the user whether it's a true positive or false positive, you can absolutely go back to your Zeek logs and see what kind of connections were going on, whether it had happened in the past before or whatnot. So it's, I, think the, I, I think there's like a whole talk that can be just on the malware detection and respond using Zeek. Finally, fingerprinting. There is some, this is something new that we have started doing. We have done DHCP fingerprinting. That means uh, we would see the DHCP um, handshake and we would determine what kind of um, <sighs> client we are running. So DHCP fingerprinting, TLS is unconstrained. So TLS, I have TLS. So before going to the next slide, so the reason of doing fingerprinting is you know what's on your network. Like the biggest defense of your network is if you do not know what you're protecting, you do not know what an attack would look like. So you have to know your network, you have to understand what clients are there, what kind of services you run. And if you have that picture in your mind, you know that how much vulnerable or how much impact a new attack can have on your network. So it's very important to know your network. So that fingerprinting techniques were primarily focused on knowing better what's running on your network and what kind of clients you are dealing with. This is a quick, when, when I said we are doing fingerprinting, this is what we are doing. So this is just example of TLS fingerprinting. On the left-hand side here, uh, SSL client and SSL server. So I will just quickly, I would not go into the detail, but there's a, there's a handshake that happens between the TLS session and that handshake is sniffed by, by Zeek. And what Zeek does is for each kind of a, a packet, each kind of unique packet, it generates an event. And if you, if you are good with Zeek scripting, then you can take all those events, extract out all the information that you want, it's pretty lame. And like, if you would just see this script, you would just know what's going on. You don't have to be an expert in Zeek scripting or any other programming language. Uh, and you just feed in um, a data set. Like for example, the, that if the handshake looks like this, then it is like this client. If the handshake looks like that, if it's a that client. So I know I'm not explaining it very well, but yeah, so this, we sniff the traffic. We, uh, if the traffic contains the TLS handshake, Zeek will sniff it and it is, uh, it is feeding, we, we fed it with the data set and it compares that, ha it hashes the basic um, fields that transpires in the handshake. It compares that hash in the data set. If it finds that hash corresponding to a client, it logs it. And if it doesn't find that hash, it just logs an unknown client. So the, the, the bold here uh, shows the, the TLS client it has seen on the network. So somebody's running MS Edge, Blue code proxy, Windows 10 native connection. 
I haven't I haven't shown the interesting ones though. It can actually detect the burp suite um, M3 attack kind of clients as well. So the clients that um, that have that unique hash of fingerprint of TLS and we block them. So it's I'm not showing it just for the sake of something we did, but we actually take actions on the bad TLS clients that we see in the traffic. Alrighty, so the final thing, the big question, is it worth it? So as I see Zeke, uh, I'm just directly jumping to the last one because I think all of the things I have discussed by default in the previous slides, uh, the big picture, it gives you a holistic view of the network traffic, what it looked like right now, what it looked like three months ago, or if you're retaining that amount of traffic. So you can absolutely go back and see what your traffic patterns look like. Um, easily digestible log files. Like It is not like a PCAP that you have to juggle through between, okay, okay I'm interested in only HTTP traffic or I'm interested in only uh, DNS traffic. It gives you flat files and you can pick and choose which one you want to retain longer. So if you only want to retain longer the connection logs, then you can absolutely do so. You cannot do that with PCAP. Like you can either throw a PCAP completely away or retain it. There might be some um, hacks that you can do, but I'm not aware of. So let me know if there are some hacks to do it. I would, be, I would love to know that. But yeah, as I said, it's flat files. It generates 50 files. You can curate them periodically, excluding the ones that you want to retain for longer. So if you are really, in, uh, you are a DNS admin and you're really interested to know the DNS log files for like three months, you can retain it for five months or six months or whatnot, right? So that's another plus point that you can pick and choose which traffic you want to retain for longer. As I view, um, we never had a PCAP full capture solution back in UD because we had Zeek and we, I was like, Zeek captures pretty much everything that we want to know on, the, on our network. And the best, part is that the best part of it is it generates flat files that are pretty easily consumable. So I don't want a PCAP, you know? So if you do not have a PCAP solution, Zeek highly recommended. Um, Zeek fits perfectly. Like Zeek is not like NetFlow that would just give you like a very tiny amount of detail. And it is not like PCAP that would just give you tons and tons of detail. It is just right. Uh, and it just gives you the right amount of traffic that you want to look at and you want to analyze and retain. So great for network analysis, network forensics and detection. So if anything matters to you or if anything that you, that you really want to look into, you can absolutely give Zeek a shot. What is the cost? Um, Zeek is open source and free tool. So it's software that is free, but there has to be community, community hardware uh, to install it and run it, right? So as I told, as I shown you before in the architecture slides that we have four Zeek nodes. So this is our commodity hardware. We have four big two U or one U boxes on which we run Zeek with good amount of memory and CPU. So you have to invest in the commodity hardware. But apart from that, Zeek is free and open source. It is still being developed and actively maintained by the community. And uh, yeah, and you can, and, and the cost also can involve in maintenance and centralizing the logs and log retention. But it is pretty much same for any other IDS tool that is available out there. If you're not paying the commodity hardware, if you're not paying the commodity part on that commercial tool, it, it, it is automatically involved in the licensing. Like you just cannot pay, you just not pay for software. You have to pay for the hardware. So even if you're shipping the hardware from like a commercial business um, X, it's going to cost you, uh, like it is going to um, uh, send you an invoice for paying for the hardware as well. Even though you can't like keep paying, the, keep paying for the hardware, commercial hardware, but definitely for the first time you have to pay it, right? So it's same thing, you just buy hardware and you just keep refreshing five years. So you don't have to pay for, you don't have to pay for hardware every year, every month. It's just like however long you want to retain it, retain it on the old hardware and then you can just move on from refreshing your old hardware to the new hardware if you're using Zeek open source. We do have a hardware question that came in uh, sure. that would be good to ask. Uh, Daniel was interested to know, uh, do you have or could you talk to the amount of CPU and memory that each worker should be allocated and maybe how much bandwidth each worker is able to handle? Yes. So uh, in our previous architecture, I showed two 10 gig links that we were sniffing, right? So overall, the, there was there, at max a 20 GPS peak can happen. I, even though we never peaked out on that level, the peak always was like 8 GBPS to 10 GBPS. But we had four workers. Each one had like a 10 gig SPF port connected with the DAC cable. And each worker had uh, 12 cores with hyper, hyper thread enabled. And uh, 
almost 64 gigs of memory. So it, it completely depends on how much um, traffic your Zeek is able to handle the box and how much we're sniffing. Like, what is the thickness of your pipe or what is the bandwidth that you are trying to sniff from the Zeek nodes? Uh, there is a really good paper uh, from Berkeley Lab. Uh, Ashish and Vince uh, wrote it like a couple of years ago. It mentions the 100 gig deployment of Zeek and they only have five servers for that deployment with uh, Mericom cards and Arista. So coming back to the question, absolutely. You just have to make sure that you have um, uh, enough uh, memory and CPU, but the architecture that we had was for for, for four physical Zeek boxes and, uh, and the overall of uh, maintaining 20 GBPS of peak, each one had each one had 12 cores with hyperthread enabled and then uh, 20, 64 gigs of memory. It might be overkill, like you would never be able, you would never peak out on using all 12 cores 100%, but it's nothing bad to have it on the box just in case your need expands in future. Like if you move from 10 gig to 100 gig deployment, or of course at that time you have to completely wipe out what you have, but at least in the transition phase, it should sustain. So each, each box, yeah, each box was capable of handling at least 10 GBPS worth of traffic. So we had four times um, more capacity to, to sniff than what we were currently sniffing. If that answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, more information about Zeek project. Great documentation available out there that talks and walks you through from getting started, how you can install it, what are the binary packages or RPM packages or source code that is available with the steps. So you can just do a yum install Zeek. It will install Zeek right out of the um, repository that they maintain. Of course, you have to load that repository in your, in your repo file for doing that, but you can build it from source as well and you have RPM packets as well. So there are different um, paths you can take from exploring and installing it on your box, depending on your need. And for the latest and greatest happenings and news, uh, I would recommend to follow the Zeek blog post and the Slack channel. They have a Slack channel. I forgot to put the link of the Slack channel, but it's open to the community. I, I'm sure that if you will go to the blog post, there, somewhere there is a blog mentioning the Slack channel that uh, got announced this year in Jan, I believe. And then if you want to go through the source code, it's on the GitHub slash the easy. So the source code is out there as well. So that's the information about the Zeek project. And I can take the questions if there are any other questions. Okay, well, thank you for, for giving this overview. I, I think it uh, really does drive home some of the, the really valuable use cases uh, for using this tool. Uh, so we're currently caught up on questions, but uh, certainly if people have any more, please put them into the, the chat room. Um, okay, Daniel has one more. Is there a performance difference between running the workers on VMs versus containers? I haven't, honestly, I haven't tried running uh, Zeek on containers. Uh, so I cannot talk about what the performance hit would look like, but unless you, un as long as you have enough resources on the box. Um, so I think the thumb off rule, if I rem remember correctly, is for one GPPS worth of traffic, you need um, at least one worker. So if you have 10 work, and from the worker, I mean not, I don't I do not mean physical box. I mean a, a worker thread on the, on the box. So we were running on each box, you we were running 10 worker processes, Zeek processes. And we had, uh, we had 10 cores. Uh, we had 12 cores, but we spared out two for uh, housekeeping purposes. So if you want to, if you, if, if each box wants to handle at least 10 GPPS of peak, the recommended, recommended rule of thumb is to run one processy for each one GPPS traffic. So for 10 gig, you have to run 10 Zeek processes on the same node. Uh, and I think that rule should be same for container and VM, but I have to test out. I haven't, uh, I have run Zeek on uh, VM. I haven't found any performance issue, but I definitely do not have any experience running it on Docker. Okay, uh, that answers that one. Uh, so we'll just pause for another minute to see if anybody else has, has other questions that they'd like to ask. 
Uh, also, I'll, I'll remind you, just uh, send me the copy of the slides. I'll make sure that those get posted for, uh, for everybody to see as well. Cool. I vote. All right, we may be, uh, we may not have any more questions that have come in, uh, but uh, certainly if people do think of them, uh, send them off to the mailing list and we'll make sure they get routed to the, the correct location. Uh, and we were also gonna do a little bit more advanced talk with you near the middle of summer in July. Uh, do you wanna maybe describe a, a little bit about what's gonna, what, what we're gonna go over in that talk? Sure, uh, so the fingerprinting, the three kinds of fingerprinting that I discussed in this talk that we are doing recently to know more about our network. Uh, one was TLS, the second one was DHCP, and the third one was unconstrained endpoints. So the DHCP one was very recent. And in that talk, I would be discussing about some deep dives, like if you want to do scripting or if you want to customize Zeek in a way that it can generate your custom, it can generate custom logs based on what it has seen on the on the traffic, then that uh, that will talk about how are the what are the steps involved with the use case of DHCP fingerprinting. So all it does is basically uh, uh, the talk will discuss about what is what are the events that gets generated whenever Zeek sees DHCP traffic on the network and how you can utilize those events uh, in your scripts and extract out the useful information that you want from those events and then uh, either do um, any kind of um, uh, analysis of those events or write it down to another log file. So that's why like DHCP fingerprinting is just a use case to explain that how those um, events right off, right off the wire can be sniffed through Zeek and then can be, um, can be uh, or not reproduced, can be modified and tuned and customized in the Zeek land scripting. Scripting is one of the another strong frameworks that Zeek supports. So I will go over what the scripting framework is and how you can use it using the DHCP fingerprinting example. Okay. Well, thank you again uh, for giving this presentation and thanks for everybody for, for joining. Uh, certainly feel free to pass this along to others on your campus uh, and we will pass along more announcements about uh, talks like this as we, we get going further into the future. Uh, for people who are still on, next week's talk is going to be uh, another ESnet talk. Uh, I happen to know those people, so they're willing to give talks. Uh, Michael Sinatra is going to be talking a little bit about manners. So if you are of the persuasion that you need to learn about that or know somebody who is, uh, we're going to try to make that a little bit more practical as well. Uh, so please tune in next week. Hope everybody has a good weekend, and we'll talk to everybody soon.